Thank you and um, welcome. I really enjoy hearing from all of you about your examples and, and questions and challenges and strategies when we get to the discussion period. And thank you, Eric and Jan, for coordinating this. And uh, kudos to my colleagues for their great work. And I gotta say, Sally, you're a real example of what one person can do. I felt burnt out just listening to you. But I also felt really inspired. Think of all the students whose worlds you've uh, broadened. So uh, I should say, actually, a, a sentence about me, as, as you did. I am a developmental psychologist who has researched for almost 30 years now intercultural competence learning among, uh, among college students, and um, including using BrassCamp's tool and presenting with Bra BrassCamp, his global prospectus inventory. And I have been for a long time now, almost 18 years, working at small liberalized colleges on comprehensive internationalization and pretty involved in the national field trying to resource that. NAFSA and some of the other national associations um, have taken uh, institutions through the ACE internationalization uh, laboratory, they call it, and been um, involved with uh, John Hudzik and, and some of the work in uh, kind of trying to broaden and, and propagate the ideas for comprehensive internationalization. So I'm very interested in, in sort of you know, sharing any of those resources. But uh, most recently, I came to Agnes Scott College in Atlanta. And we are uh, an unusually diverse small women's liberal arts college. We uh, have a little over 1,000 students now. But we, are, um, we have no racial and ethnic majority, about a third African American, a third white European American, and a third everything else. Uh, when I came, it was about 12% international. It's taken a really big hit since Trump. We're more like 6% now. But before, uh, they, they have been. They have been strong in, in global and international for a long time. They've been sending over 50% of their students on um, traditional study abroad programs, both through uh, faculty-led uh, for sort of traditional faculty-led for upper-class students, and also through a uh, heavy use of the ICEP multilateral exchange framework. So many, many students going to study uh, around the world directly in, in universities through that. So, <clears throat> it, and, and also a, a strong language requirement, a, a two full year language requirement. So they had been committed, but, and, and you know, and it, those are beautiful students, and, and, and we are blessed with a decent endowment. Still, many, many challenges, but that, that's, uh, that's not, not a small thing. And, and our mission statement. So despite um, many of those assets, we have also been very much facing the same challenges that liberal arts colleges across the country are. And s about seven years ago, uh, the college decided that really long term, they needed to do something bolder to more compellingly answer the question, you know, why Agnes Scott? That, that while of course they had a great education, you know, we all have great educations, and, and frankly, when you're a 17-year-old on that circuit, it all starts sounding the same. You know, everybody's got small classes and great faculty and good first-year programs. And, and so they decided that for long, long term, at this point they were around 800, um, <clears throat> and decided that for long-term sustainability that they did need to grow a, a little bit uh, to be able to scale up for all of the infrastructure that students today uh, need, and that to do so, um, you know, wasn't a question of just better marketing or better um, admission staff. That really, we needed the, the the educational program to be more focused to take some of our strengths and kind of double down and go big and bold. So this was the decision again that the previous president Elizabeth Keish kind of uh, helped the, the the trustees and the faculty come to that that really kind of business as usual was not going to cut it. Uh, the status quo was not an option. So there was a um, large process of um, vetting, <laughs> nominating and vetting potential big ideas. I mean, we were good at multiple things. You know, we were good at social justice and integrative learning and uh, women's empowerment. And so they basically nominated uh, like nine or so potential big idea candidates and, and did some market testing. And this was very different to have a strategic plan that was you know, not internally driven about what everybody wanted a piece of, but really looking at our students today and what would resonate. And actually, I, I, going back a minute, I, I inserted global into the title because that's my focus today, but I'll, I'll situate it in the bigger context. But we've been using this for the 21st century for a long time. And I realized just this year when our students 
were incoming students were born in the 21st century. I think we've got to lose that language because like they would be thinking like, yeah, what century would I be coming for? You know, I think that speaks to parents and like us, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on new language. Anyhow, so through this whole process, uh, as this part of this, this growth strategy, we came to deciding that the, that the two themes, well, yeah, of global, uh, that's the next slide, but so um, we decided that our promise to students was gonna be to prepare every student to be an, elect, uh, an effective leader in a global society. And so the way that we're doing that is specifically around, we transformed our, ourselves around the themes of global learning and leadership development throughout the curriculum and co-curriculum. And uh, in addition, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that, we've also infused digital literacy skills and other skills for post acting success, critical skills, throughout the curriculum, culminating in a digital portfolio to curate and showcase that for external audiences. And it is all sort of su supported and integrated through a four-part personal board of advisors that includes um, a, a professional advisor and a major advisor, a peer advisor, and career advisor. And I'm realizing I'm having the same, the same problem there with that last line. I'll make sure to read it out. In any case, I'm going to be, so this is the four-part, we call it Summit, the initiative that we launched in 2015. I was recruited uh, as, as part of the um, final stages of, of uh, design to, to come and lead this, and it was really, uh, I couldn't refuse the opportunity because, as I said, the boldness of the vision and the degree of buy-in, and it's like taking the work I had been doing for 13 years sort of, you know, to the next level, putting it on, on, on steroids for, for every student as central to their experience. So I'll uh, say a lot more about the global aspect. <laughs> and so, you know, when we started out, of course, defining what we really meant by global learning. A lot of different faculty had different views about that. You know, is, is it area studies? Is it um, intercultural learning? So lots of, lots of debates. It was very important to try to get that right, to be, you know, inclusive, but um, coherent and, and, and strong. And I will say, you know, we continue to revisit this. And, you know, four years in, well, throughout, we've been very iterative in assessing and tweaking kind of like you were saying, the little mid-course corrections, which you can do. I mean, that piece about agility really is true. And, uh, but, but just now, having graduated our first class last year, we've taken a little bit of a bigger step back and, and are sort of in the process of launching a bit of a, a Summit 2.0. And so we, you know, we went back and sort of redefined, uh, not redefined, sharpened our definition of global even more and kind of tightened it and kind of raised the bar because four years into it, we felt like we could, we could make it even more coherent for our, for our students. So at the beginning, again, we also struggled with this whole question of boldness. Is it bold enough? Is it too bold? How the heck are we gonna do this, you know? And, and I do wanna say that, um, I mean, it, it, it is a process <laughs> and I encourage, you know, and, and I should have said at the beginning, of course, the things we chose were things that were really, really true to our mission and, and who we were and authentic to us. And, and that has to be the way every institution works and evolves. And so, you know, if you're grounded in that, you, you can't just uh, decide sometimes, and again, this comes to the building the, <laughs> building the car as you, as you drive it, uh, in, in sort of the abstract, you just have to start. You have to start somewhere. You have to start with the low-hanging fruit, you know, and, and you can build and build. So that's been a real theme, you know. We've been under construction the whole time, using iterative thinking, a lot of assessment. Here's another image I have of that, you know. <laughs> it's just not been kind of like quite what we thought starting over, but, but we're getting somewhere. <laughs> we're getting in the, in the, in the right direction, um, <clears throat> you know, through, through twists and turns. So to the content of what we did come up with, we have uh, defined global learning for us as the ability to recognize and navigate structures, patterns, and challenges that span the globe and shape human lives. And again, this is you know, inclusive of, of really all of our disciplines, um, pretty, pretty different from area studies. Uh, we, we very consciously decided to be clear that the globe includes us, includes the US, and you know when we get to uh, some of our kind of flagship program, y you'll see that we have every year uh, at least one or two that are uh, domestic. We've had Puerto Rico, we've had um, 
um, Navajo Nation, we've had New Orleans, this year we have New York, I think we're looking at Hawaii for next year, so we very much have uh, included the U.S. in that. And so um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the key concepts that we address in the core courses. Contact power and systems that cross or transcend national borders is, again, this is the definition that we were just workshopping like three weeks ago during break to, we had people from all different disciplines coming and talking about how in their courses they're looking at contact power and systems. And this is where like originally we were like, well, maybe two out of three is enough and we're, we're, kind, of, we're kind of raising raising the bar. So um, the, the sequence starts uh, in, in their first year where their spring course, again, it's in this larger context, so their fall course is a leadership, uh, four credit leadership course, but their spring course, they all take a four credit global learning course and there are you know, 15 different sections with different um, themes related to the professor's in disciplinary expertise and they all go on a, have a one credit uh, eight day global immersion experience in March at the same time. And so the theme is obviously also related to that destination. So, you know, Cuba with economics and uh, we had, you know, STEM in Croatia and all, you know, all different um, disciplines and themes. <clears throat> and I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that because the, um, benefits of sending students in their first year has have been transformative for our students and for ourselves and and it's been an incredibly heavy lift as I'm sure you can imagine. We do still have the language requirement I mentioned and then after that first year, uh, well sometimes it's during the first year but students in addition to that first year take three courses we call summit in breadth so in arts and humanities or in STEM or in social science and these would be the ones that would be addressing this contact power and systems on the global side that I mentioned. And um, we, we also have a real focus ourselves on, again, the diversity and inclusion piece and the power piece. So one of those must focus on dominant and mar marginalized cultures, groups, and subcultures. So this is just a, um, oh, and after that first year, then students may opt into a specialization in the global learning area. And if they do that, they take an advanced core global learning seminar and uh, additional of those uh, breadth courses I mentioned, um, more upper level language study and a second global experience. So the whole semester long study abroad typically. And again, you know, we, we are seeing that only increase. So this is just a, a graphic sort of, of how it all fits together. And again, the foreign language is two full, two full years. So this is just another little bit about our journeys course. That's what we call the, the first year um, requirement. As I said, they're all over. We really strive for a geographic balance every year. We don't go farther, right? Well, we have so far consistently not gone farther than seven hours time difference just because for eight days, you know, there's sort of trying to, trying to minimize jet lag, which means that um, we really, we still offer upper level, more traditional faculty-led programs, and we try to really focus those on Asia and the places that we you know, can't get to during, during our journeys. But they are all having about 40% common content on these themes, identity, self, other, globalization, imperialism, colonialism, the diaspora, and ethics of travel. So that is a baseline that all of our students have, core readings and those core assignments in that. You can build on that in all of your other courses, you know, sort of knowing that we're on the same page. And that's really made these experiences different. You know, some of our providers say, oh, your students, you know, they're prepared in a different way. Their conscious travels in a different way because of this uh, broad foundation that they have before. And then during, these are not your tourist courses, of course, like I'm sure that you, you all are doing, they're community-based. They are getting into places that they could never get on their own. They're looking at, you know, these issues, immigration, everywhere they go. They're um, connecting with students, connecting with activists, having homestays and a lot of reflection. And then they come back afterwards and they have the last half of the semester to do a lot of reflection. In their own groups, we mix them up for one course so they're reflecting across destinations and that's always really, really interesting. I will say these are included in the cost of tuition so that was a big investment that our trustees made initially. It is paying off as you'll see in a second. 
but um, this means, I mean, a lot of our students have never been on a plane, have some of them never been outside of Georgia. So this has been truly transformative for, for them and, and really for the entire institution. I have beautiful pictures. We all have beautiful pictures of, <laughs> of the different things our students do. These are our destinations for this year. And again, we always have a balance of disciplines and, and um, continents. So that's really the curricular focus. We also try to weave global learning throughout the co-curricular experience. So here's just some examples. We've got a film series that ties in, International Education Week, coffee hours led by international students, um, uh, impact peer leaders. We have a, a, a at the same time, <laughs> a, a sort of upper level service experience going on at the same time that we, we tie in with the same themes. We also have uh, upper class students leaders joining each of these programs. Um, call them Schmidt Global Student Leaders because of a donor who funded it and I teach that class. So it's a leadership class for upper class students who are then serving as basically TAs. And more recently, uh, just to kind of get to um, <clears throat> the discussion period, we are focusing, as I said, in this 2.0 on, on connecting all of it into more of an aligned four-year scaffolded program, sort of as you heard about as well, where, again, th this involves the bigger piece, but where it's clearer how it all fits together and, again, leads our students to post admin success. I'm sure you're all as well feeling this, um, you know, increased need to make those connections explicit. And so we're kind of bringing it in line with a, a, a larger four-year um, discover, explore, connect, create framework that's related to career exploration. But the curricular piece, the co-curricular piece, and the team-based advising all working together. So our initial results have honestly exceeded our expectations. Our assessment data is very promising so far. Uh, this, these are um, items on the GPI, Larry Brass Camp's Measure of Intercultural Competence that uh, we're, you know, we see significant findings on. Our retention is up to a college record. You know, I myself, when I took the first group to uh, Bolivia, I had students who were, you know, really on the fence about about transferring out and that bonding experience was um, made the difference for them choosing to stay. Uh, again, some of it is a little too early to see about long term having just had our first group graduate, but for the student experience uh, is uh, very promising. As an institution, it has also um, met or exceeded our results. It has absolutely been a growth strategy. We have, uh, you know, grown considerably, as I said, we've from low 800s to um, up over a thousand this year. Uh, higher yields, higher, uh, I mentioned retention already. And students, admitted students, are reporting that this is very, 95% uh, this year, important or very important to their decision. The first year was two thirds, then three out of four, and now 95%. Classes have also been a little bit stronger academically uh, with more global background, a little bit, a little bit, more financial ability to pay, although we still really want our 40 percent, <laughs> our 40 percent uh, Pell eligible students to be coming, as well as we we have a lot of other kinds of diversity, a lot of GLBTQ plus diversity, a lot of religious diversity, and we very much want to retain all of that. It has had, um, again, way more than I expected national recognition um, impacts. We have, um, you know, for better or worse, depending how you feel about the U.S. News and World Report, been um, number one most innovative two years in a row number one for first year experience this year, number four for best undergraduate teaching this year. Social mobility is the one I'm proudest of. That's of course not a reputational ranking, but uh, so we, we feel that these things are really making a difference and students are actually, there's sort of a halo effect where they are rating us higher on things that we didn't even change <laughs> in terms of our, our um, um, uh, admitted student surveys. So I also wanted to get to lessons learned and takeaway. I know I'm uh, running short on time here, so I'll go quickly, but I mentioned how important it is to define the key terms at the outset, keep your goals in mind, revisit. I mentioned uh, pace, that you can't get it all perfect at first. You shouldn't go too fast, but you really shouldn't go too slow. You could really lose momentum. Keeping student experience central, we have had focus groups and advisory groups throughout. Um, diversity and inclusion in every aspect, at every stage, asking how that's going to impact all students. Um, Building on successes, we all know we have our third rails on our campus. Oh, don't try that. that. We all hated that. You know, This is a point of pride. Build on what's working. You've heard that before here as well. In any case, growing out of our real liberal arts, 
Engaging the faculty is my, my big thing. This is what I spend pretty much all my time doing, and I just came from presenting at AACNU, two different sessions on specifically this, engaging the faculty. And so I could talk a lot about you know, ways that I've used elected committees, ex existing shared governance structures, uh, built in some, some faculty positions to help lead this, lots of communication, extrinsic motivators to faculty to be involved, but also intrinsic, and I think the intrinsic are the better. I mean, not only are resources scarce, but you know, a little bit of stipend only goes so far, but if you hook into what brought faculty to this work in the first place, their own love of intellectual learning and simulation and their dedication to their students, that's the source of, of energy that kind of uh, really p powers this. So we have built in things that faculty love, like team teaching and interdisciplinary conversation, lots of professional development, external resources, sending uh, folks out two resources, a whole, we sent a whole group to faculty to build their own capacity, to Jamaica, to build their own capacity to participate in one of these experiences so they could see how to lead it. Creating space for leadership and innovation everywhere, decentralized, rewarding it, even critics, embracing the critics, <laughs> including all disciplines. So I know I went quickly over those. Again, I'd love to hear, you know, what's working on your campuses. This is um, you know, one of our students in her own literal summit. <laughs> and uh, this is another, this is our, uh, our Agnes Scott that we're named after the, the Scottish Presbyterian uh, mother of our founder. And we take Flat Agnes, our students do, everywhere they go, they take photos of Flat Agnes and you know, all around the world, everywhere with them. And uh, some of our physics students put a little helmet on her and shot her into space. So uh, <laughs> I like this image of you know, honoring our heritage but shooting for new horizons. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we are going to have 24 minutes of, uh, for a discussion. So we have, uh, if you have questions here or questions online, uh, please raise your hand and we are going to pass by the microphone. Thank you. 
here because both sides of the discussion are used not body. So for me, there were no ways to make this master base model uh, available cheaper than the R2 from factor above model. Whereas I use that, um, that still true. You still don't have to watch a second block, but we did decide to invest from, and we did make an initial investment in random in the sum of R2 for this three point, which keeps the prices pretty low. Um, but um, and but I will say that it is the, the net position revenue that we gain is over the two weeks from Zoom. It makes our and the other thing to enjoy is uh, grants. I've been able to. I have a, a large grant that funds board subscription tickets, and I just donated another big grant. And donors are motivated by the social mobility of this program, and not just individual donors, but corporate donors are really stepping up and seeing the two issues of income inequality and are are contributing. So that's the route that I'm going. But I took an initial investment, but not a big investment. And so J track, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Um, just a note, we uh, probably need uh, to be speaking uh, into yeah. the yes. microphone because for our remote, so if you want to continue. Mm -hmm. you, do you have more to say? No, I don't have any, I mean, I can recap briefly that those are very real issues and that I think it's easier to do them at a semester level and I'm happy to share more about that. But at the, at the short term level, I think they're very real issues, but there is some external funding available. So for JTERM courses, uh, students pay, in addition to the tuition, they have to pay for the cost of, of the, the actual trip. So we worked with an agent to, to figure out you know, the, the flight and then also uh, hotels, reservations, and then students pay a little bit extra to cover our expenses. So professors have the benefit of going included in the, in the package, so we don't pay anything. Uh, but the students, for example, our Peru trip uh, study tour was $3,700 extra that the students had to come up with. And as we look at all the competition of all the other courses, I were trying to draw our students, come on, come, let's go to Machu Picchu, let's go, I know, Peru. It's an amazing experience. They, they also look at other prices, and they might decide where they're going based on uh, how much it's going to cost them. Because initially, that is extra. They can work with the financial aid, get help in different ways, uh, funding. However, it is an extra cost. Um, so the incentive for professors is that it's all covered uh, for, for students. And we really work really hard to make it affordable. But if you spend 16 days in Peru with flights and hotels and entrance to Machu Picchu, entrance to hotel, I mean, it, it starts to add up to, you know, couldn't be lower than 3,700. And we needed at least 16 students to make the trip go because otherwise it couldn't, it wouldn't cost, it wouldn't cover all of our costs as well. So it, it is you know, always a challenge, but that's how we make J-terms uh, work. Uh, at Pacific, it's, it's absolutely also an issue. So these travel, these winter travel courses are expensive, but we're using a similar strategy to Agnes Scott. So um, we've been really fortunate to have a very supportive dean who has set aside a certain amount of funds to support these travel programs as Global Scholars gets going. Um, with the strategy that this is a program that's going to draw more students to the university. And if we can build enrollment by even five or 10 students, that additional enrollment will pay for itself. Um, the, the program will pay for itself. Again, this isn't a university-wide effort, it's a small cohort, but if we get five additional students, the, their tuition will, will cover the cost of the program. She's been willing to put in seed money to start with. Um, as we get started, we've also been able to, um, to uh, secure some grants. And while that grant funding won't cover student costs directly, it can subsidize faculty costs so we can lower the cost to students overall. Our objective over time is for that um, Global Scholars first year travel course to be at no additional expense to students. Um, how we get there, we're not sure. We're, we're actively working with, um, with our foundation relations to uh, f folks to find some money, find a, a sponsor who wants to, to cover that. Um, and, and again, it, it is very attractive because these issues are, are top of mind, not just for us, but also for um, philanthropists in our communities. Any other questions out there? Yeah. Oh, hold. Oh, 
Oh, you have a second one. Huh? Is that on? No. Yeah. It is. Okay. 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 All right. So thank you all. Those are all really interesting. And I'm wondering, a couple of you just mentioned different grant funding sources. I was wondering if you could share any good places to start looking for, for grants, federal or whatever, that, that support this type. Because a lot have so many restrictions on, on things that that's been one thing that we've been seeking different types of grant funding, but haven't been too successful. Okay, I'm nervous because I'm applying for both of these right <laughs> now. <laughs> but <laughs> um, we mentioned in our uh, in our program the Capacity Building for Study Abroad program. That's um, a program through the State Department. Um, it's now called the Ideas Program, and you can find that at um, I think it's called. Oh, if you look in our slides, you can you can find the link to that. Um, so capacity building for study abroad or ideas. Uh, so that's one, it's a small grant, it's uh, up to $35,000 and it can't directly fund student travel, um, but it's also specifically diversity focused. It's really aimed at getting um, more students and underrepresented students abroad and diversifying um, the locations that uh, an institution serves, uh, travels to and also the capacity of the institution. Um, the second one is the UISFL federal grant. This is a bigger grant. It's really competitive and it's focused on undergraduate international studies and foreign language. And so what they're really looking for are innovative interdisciplinary programs that combine language and international study. Um, or combine international studies with um, business or healthcare or, or um, you know, a more specific area study. That um, application just, uh, the call for proposals just opened for that and is due the end of March, so good luck to you. <laughs> um, it's a, a really extensive process. And those are great federal possibilities. I have been more focused recently at private, more at, at foundations um, and corporate. And uh, so the, the foundations that have been the most generous to me are, are local to Atlanta, so I don't know that they would be helpful to you. It would be more like what's, what's available in yours. But I, I did, uh, I have a, a major uh, Coca-Cola Coca Foundation grant that's sponsoring three of my journeys and another, um, another one I just got from another major uh, Goyce Weta Foundation, it's called Local Foundation. But, but, uh, but what I'm looking at more and more now is, is corporate, um, it's not actually foundations, it's really corporate sponsorship. And this is tapping into the corporate social responsibility area. So there are, you know, it's a really growing area where, you know, corporations, um, employees and consumers, you know, want to know that they're doing good. You know, you see whatever, you get on a Delta plane and you see the little video about them volunteering and the, they, they want to be able to talk about the good that they're doing. And so, uh, and as I said, I think income inequality is a huge, huge issue. So. I am talking to a number of the major corporations in our area and pitching. And I mean, this might make your faculty uncomfortable. It makes some of my faculty a little bit uncomfortable, but literally it's kind of like a co-branding thing, um, a, a sponsorship thing where, you know, it, it, one of some of the journeys will be the blank journey, blah, 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 because, you know, they, uh, they get that sort of um, credit for, for, for doing that kind of help. But it's, I think it's a huge and growing area. Personally, I feel like, you know, corporations are sort of stepping into the vacuum that's been created by public disinvestment in education, and I'm going to let them do it, you know, if, I mean, if somebody's, somebody's going to help. So that's, that's a big area that I'm going into. Well, thank you so much for sharing those. And I should just say, in addition to questions, I just love to hear your own strategies, too. Um, I'm still thinking about the all of this. I'm I'm kind of overwhelmed, so I don't know how well I'll articulate a question. But I was thinking we were speaking earlier about your um, your general ed branding, the international and diverse perspectives. Is that? And I liked how you broke it down um, and gave the definition during the talk. I wondered, is that in your catalog? Is that something I could show? We're in the middle of a general ed review right now, and, and argue, um, we're discussing definitions. And so I thought that might be um, something helpful that I could take back to our own gen ed 
committee and also I happen to, I, I was listening about strategic placement. This is the one thing at small universities, we wear many hats and we go many different places in different committee meetings. And so I'm actually going to be on a, a, a committee for the strategic plan of our liberal arts um, branch of my university. And so I'm just thinking strategically about, about all this. I might reach out again, because you, you've all been very, I don't know, invested in quiet ways. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, we, those opportunities of redoing your core, though that's when you jump in, because that's what Erica and I did. In addition to everything else that we're doing, we um, are a three, on a three-person committee for the IDP designation. So the third person is a faculty member in the sociology department. So he brings into our committee the, the sort of he's um, deeply uh, into the um, yes critical race studies. Thank you. And so he brings that perspective, and we together defined the three SLOs that mm -hmm. Erica laid mm -hmm. out um, for the IDP designated courses. Mm -hmm. So we just did it. Mm -hmm. We just said, that's what all IDP courses have to do. Mm -hmm. And we're part of the curriculum committee that approves IDP courses. <laughs> and so we were able to <laughs> infuse you know, this um, intercultural piece as the nexus. We held uh, two faculty development um, workshops that faculty got s really small mini grants to attend. Mm -hmm. And that's how we created buy-in, that's how we created a common language of around IDP courses. Mm -hmm. And how um, we had uh, faculty from arts and sciences, from, s from the social sciences and the natural sciences all participating in this program. So the only core uh, part of our um, required core that we recently revamped that doesn't have an IDP course is quantitative reasoning, mm -hmm. but we're working on that. We've already identified mm -hmm. two faculty that are really excited mm -hmm. to get IDP designation for their courses, so it's just a matter of building that um, repertoire of IDP courses. And yes, it's on our um, in Pacific's website. Okay. You can see Excellent. those. Um, there's a dedicated page to um, international and diverse okay. perspectives. Oh, awesome! You can see I the website on if you search for undergraduate core. Uh -huh. um, it'll pull it'll up be there. Yeah. Okay. I, I have a follow up to that too. I just wondered how you were all going about assessing. Um, intercultural learning, are you doing it through critical perspectives? Are you doing the systems rubric from AAC and U? Um, because a lot of us look at the rubrics and we're thinking, well, parts of them work, parts of them are insufficient. Are you, are you making your own or how is this working for you? So we, we have adapted the AAC and U value rubric uh, for the parts that work for us. So we have a, a version of it that we've used uh, consistently in our courses. We also have, you know, in some of the co-curriculars, other, other ways of evaluating program by program. And then I have a overall multi-method longitudinal sort of study where we're looking every year at students on some national measures like, as I mentioned, Brass Camp's Global Perspectives Inventory and, uh, and some sort of behavioral descriptions of their own interactions, uh, you know, the diversity of their own contexts. And, um, so that, you know, and we're going to be doing in April of, of one year out for the alumni so that I have some things that are, you know, that I can look at nationally and also very much over time. But so we have sort of what I think of as kind of tree level and then some forest level assessments. But, but there's still a lot of work to do, I would say. We're still, <laughs> we're still um, um, you know, yeah, we have not achieved the sort of gold standard of having kind of multiple data points uh, uh, like I would like on each student. But. So we also have adapted the AACNU value rubric for intercultural learning. Mm -hmm. um, but we kind of, we do assessment in, in sort of three ways um, and we're at different stages. Um, the first is that when a course applies to receive the IDP designation, they have to describe how they intend to assess each of those SLOs, the intercultural, 
the, or the, uh, the intercultural, the international, and the diverse. And then the, the, the group of us who um, designate or, or give our stamp of approval to the designation determine whether we think that it meets those SLOs. Um, we don't use a specific rubric in that case. Um, that rubric really comes in when the university from the top down is looking at accreditation. So uh, intercultural learning is one of our core themes for accreditation and within the College of Arts and Science, that's assessed through our IDP, that two credit IDP. Um, and so sort of coming from both ends and in the center is, is the AAC and the I'm curious if uh, if any of you uh, want to share some of your innovative <laughs> or creative practices. What are you doing within the constraints of small budgets and small staffs? Or if you have gigantic staffs <laughs> <laughs> and, and well-endowed budgets, how did you come by them? <laughs> teacher so I'm allowing that that extra time <laughs> Thank you very much all for attending today. Thank you for those of you who are attending virtually as well. Um, I think we've all included contact information on our slides. They're available through the Whova app as well. Um, so uh, do feel free to reach out to us. Uh, would any of you like to say any parting words? <laughs> no, we, I think we can stick around. I mean, I know yeah. lunch is calling, but we can stick yeah. around if you have one-on-one -on -one questions right. as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> still. <laughs>